thanks a lot. First of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is reservoir recurrent neural networks. Um, yeah, and this slide is just to, again, recall uh, the, 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 the major salient aspects of my activity that is related to machine learning, deep learning, deep neural networks, and dynamical systems. So here you can, uh, you can have, uh, you can see my, my email, so please feel free to, to get in touch whenever you see fit. And uh, I'm really open to collaborations, to discussions, and to get involved in, into uh, collaborations again uh, at every level. Okay, So feel free to, to, to write me. OK, so um, for today, I would like to uh, introduce you this concept of, let's say, fastly trained deep learning models for sequential data. Okay, so this is called reservoir computing. And in order to uh, introduce this uh, methodology uh, in a proper way, I would like to um, first start with an introduction to uh, recurrent neural networks. And that, that gives uh, at, at least a little bit of motivation for dealing with uh, recurrent neural networks, which uh, in, in this part, I will assume that you have some basic knowledge of deep learning and machine learning. Um, then I would like to, to introduce the, some concepts, or at least to, to point to literature uh, in relation to randomization in deep neural networks. Then we are uh, going to move to reservoir computing and other concepts that are related to reservoir computing and perhaps some new developments in the field. So uh, regarding questions, for me, it is fine whenever you see fit to raise your hand or to ask me questions, in particular when you will see, let's say, uh, a green uh, background in the slide, okay? So uh, um, when there is a, the green background in the slide, I'm going to change topics. So perhaps it's a good moment to ask uh, questions regarding to the, to the previous part. Okay, uh, or af uh, after the, the, the talk at the end. So that, that, that's fine as well. Um, okay, just uh, like I said, I'm going to assume a little bit of uh, basic information about machine learning, but I would like to introduce the motivation and some basic concepts about the recurrent neural network. So I assume you are a, a little bit at least familiar with neural networks and with the, the working and the operation of a neural network, but uh, not necessarily with recurrent neural networks. For those of you who are already familiar with them, perhaps you will be bored to that, I hope not, but maybe it could be also a useful recall for the uh, key uh, concepts. Okay, starting from motivation. So why to use a recurrent neural network? So su um, suppose uh, in, for our research project, we have to predict the value of some specific entity. This happens all the time, okay? Um, so you can see this entity, you can see this like um, a point in a vector space, okay? That contains all the necessary variables and information to describe the phenomenon that you are trying to modeling. Um, so this can be anything, but let's say for the sake of example, suppose that we want to model or to predict the three-dimensional three location of a robot or a user in, in the, in the three-dimensional space. So in this case, this entity is a vector with three uh, entries, okay? Um, so in practice, uh, we consider uh, just a single position, okay? And uh, our, our aim is to predict the next position. Of, of this uh, person inside the environment. Um, okay, suppose we can, uh, we can describe the position of, of the user somehow. Um, well, the point is that if I am looking only uh, at the atomic piece of information at the present time step, okay, in this exact moment, then if I have to predict where the user is going, this becomes a little bit uh, a problem. So there is a lot of uncertainty, okay? But what happens if I give you the information uh, related to the location of the user in, of this person in the previous uh, time, okay? So in the previous moments in time. So now it's really easy and you will agree with me that it is, let's say, very easy to see that the uncertainty almost disappears and we can forecast, let's say, the, the position of the user better, okay? Okay, so that's just, a, um, just to give you a sense and the intuition and the motivation why we want to deal with recurrent neural networks and why we deal, need to deal with causality um, and co consequentiality of the information that has been um, dealt by the neural network. Of course, there are a lot uh, other in, uh, examples, like for example, in the area of natural language processing, if I want to predict the next word in a sentence, like in this case, the sun is in the blank, then it's easy to see that perhaps we can agree on the word sky. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
if I am constrained only at looking at this very specific atomic piece of information preceding the word that I have to that I have to predict, like the only the, then it becomes very difficult to understand uh, which one could be the the next word. Okay, so we I think we can all agree that um, the causality assumption is really important when we deal with time series or sequential forms of data in the real world. And yeah, I have another example, but you can understand easily. For example, in the case of a, a, a musical composition, more or less the same things happen here. Yeah, there is the piano roll. And the piano roll means that uh, the rows are the different notes and the green dot means that that note is played in that specific time uh, and the columns actually are the time steps so in, in a discretized fashion so it, for example in this point it, it's quite um, let's say it, it is possible to start forecasting the following notes given the previous notes but if, you, I, if I give you only one single column, so one single uh, atomic information in time, then it becomes quite difficult to, to forecast the next configuration of the piano roll. Okay, so the importance of causality, and we need to model that inside our uh, neural network model. Um, so in a sense, uh, when we try to model sequential form of data, uh, we want to extend uh, the possible uh, the possible things that we can do with a neural network okay and with the machine learning model more in general so we start from uh, what is called one-to-one -one type of uh, computational learning task uh, that is the one typical of uh, let's say um, conventional neural networks applications like think about convolutional neural networks or in general field forward architectures where you have uh, an input information x you elaborate this information using your uh, neural network layers in this green part and then you provide your output y okay so we call this one to one because we have an atomic information in input and we have an atomic information in output this is the starting point okay like for example in the case of image classification that you all know um, so what happens when we introduce the concept of sequ sequential processing in this picture okay so we can extend to deal with the case of many to one tasks which means we have a uh, sequential information in input and we have let's say one single atomic information in output um, examples are like sequence classifications mm, or sentiment analysis like we have an input a sentence we want to predict the polarity of uh, the, the concept expressed by the sentence so this one is called many to one um, then we can also have the case of sequence transduction where we have uh, a sequence both in input and in output and these two sequences are isomorphic so we have at every time step we have an information let's say in input and we want uh, uh, any information in output so for example we uh, are in the context of human activity recognition for instance where for every time step i want to predict what the user is doing or video frame classification when i want to classify all the frames in a video etc um, and then there are two um, let's say more uh, more specific um, more and more peculiar let's say um, types of uh, of uh, tasks like uh, one to many and in this in this case for example we have an atomic information in input like an image and a sequential form uh, of information in output like a textual description of the image in, in an image captioning problem and finally we can have uh, what is called many to many or sequence to sequence sometimes um, like in the case of machine translation when we have a, a, a sequence both in input and in output but these two sequences uh, can be of different length okay so they don't need to be isomorphic in their structure so um, to wrap up what i want to say is that we want to move from the situation in which our neural network architecture can only deal with this type of uh, situation on the leftmost case in the in this slide to uh, an entire variety of uh, possible applications like uh, many to many um, yeah one to many sequence transductions or uh, many to one okay all right and uh, like i said i'm trying to assume that you are more or less familiar with uh, neural networks but let's say just for the sake of the introduction um Let's revisit a little bit the operation of a feedforward neural network. So we call it feedforward because we give an input the information, 
uh, X and we uh, do the processing one layer after the other, perhaps in this case, just one layer, and then we observe the output. Okay, so in one end, we introduce the input in the other end, we uh, observe the output. There is no, uh, let's say, re reverberating or feedback um, in, of the information. So the information is never fed, fed back uh, to be reprocessed over time. Okay, so we have input pre processing through the layers of our architecture and then output. So there is no notion of sequence or causality in the elaboration of the information. Okay, and so in practice, from a mathematical perspective, we can see this like, a, um, let's say, a filtering, um, a purification, let's say, of the information that is really very easily uh, implemented like a, a function uh, of the input. Okay, so we have the input tax, we mm, modify this information by a function f uh, that is parameterized by a weight vector or a weight matrix w and a, a bias vector b. Um, and in practice, this typically takes the form of, uh, uh, let's say, an affine transformation followed by a nonlinearity. So this is the affine transformation followed by the nonlinearity f. Okay, And uh, this operation is, uh, let's say, parameterized by a number of uh, tunable parameters, free parameters uh, that, that are, let's say, adjusted using training algorithms typically based on stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation. Okay, so given this uh, type of elementary machinery, how can we deal with temporal information? Um, one possibility and a starting point uh, is the um, trivial handling of time. So we have, let's say, uh, an input information, okay? Um, that is uh, sequential, okay? We can assume that there is a, a, a sort of causal um, assumption, okay? And in practice, this means that uh, information at the second time step, X2, uh, follows somehow X1, and X3 follows both X1 and X2, et cetera. Mm? So there is a temporal uh, relation or causality relation in the input. Uh, what we can do is we can apply the same architecture that uh, I have introduced oh. In the previous slide, we can apply this same architecture uh, identically at, at every time step. Okay, so we have this kind of situation here, um, where in practice we have a number of uh, time steps x1, x2, x3, etc., up to x5. And based on, let's say, the general information at time step t, uh, xt, we apply the same transformation and we get the output uh, yt. So we are in practice ignoring temporal dependencies. We are treating this information, uh, let's say, uh, all in an atomic fashion. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we assume that there is a, a sort of temporal uh, relation, what we can do, uh, for example, we would like, and this is our typical situation, we would like that actually the output, for example, in the last time step, depends also on the information that was uh, introduced in the network in the previous time step, okay? If perhaps at the beginning. Um, so if we deal with atomic information alone, this is of course uh, not possible. Mm -hmm. One uh, trivial way of dealing with time in this kind of situation is buffering or windowing uh, the input. And um, what I mean, uh, for example, suppose that I want to compute the output here for the time step three, X3, then what I can do, uh, instead of considering this atomic information alone, I can consider, let's say a window around this uh, X3 uh, input and, that, and then in this way I can compute the output y3. Uh, but of course there are downsides in this kind of uh, situation because I can only capture the, uh, let's say, the, the short extent local structure, local to every time step in this way. And um, let's say uh, I still con continue to ignore all the uh, temporal dependencies outside of the window. So the, the length of the window is crucial. So if I fail to determine the correct length of the window, or let's say the, um, yeah, of our window, then in, this, in that case, let's say the, um, uh, it, it still becomes, uh, it still is impossible to, in this case, for example, to, to have that our output Y5 um, depends on the input X1 at the beginning, okay? Um, so this one is crucial and this type of operation is the same of, let's say, time delay neural networks or uh, one dimensional convolutional neural networks, okay, they share the same idea. Um, so we need to, to find a solution to this and in order to, 
properly treating time, one, um, one uh, solution is given by uh, the introduction of neurons with a state. Okay, so what we do, we introduce a memory cell state. Uh, in this case, it is indicated by H. So in practice here, we, um, for every, let's say, time step, we compute an intermediate representation of the entire input history. Okay, so we are introducing a new concept, okay, the state of the system. So in practice, we now say that our output is a function at, at every time step T of the current input and of the prior history that is encoded inside a state um, indicated by the letter H, okay? And then here I am using the uh, index to denote time. Okay. All right, so now if again, my, my purpose is, uh, is to make the uh, output of my system at the very last time step dependent on the input at the beginning. Now, uh, as uh, I am introducing this other path for the information propagation related to this, uh, let's say, um, cell state uh, information, then now it becomes possible to see that the input information at the very beginning of the time series can have a way to reach the output, okay, in the very last time step. Okay, so at least um, in principle, this, uh, this idea of introducing a state of our, uh, of our system, so a, a, a dynamical state that is updated at each time step uh, to represent the entire input history, then in this case, we can see that this allows us to deal with um, uh, arbitrarily long uh, input time series. Uh, while this was not possible in the case of, let's say, windowing uh, the, the, the input. Okay, so coming to a mathematical formulation, um, yeah, in order to develop that, that we, we can see that actually in, in our architecture, we have now two components, okay? So we have, let's say the, uh, we have a number of components. The basic component is, sorry, this uh, recurrent layer or cell that is indicated in, in green. Um, this in practice computes uh, this state update function. So it computes a state HT that depends on the input at the current time step and on the state in the previous time step. Mm -hmm. So in practice, this intermediate layer of our architecture computes a representation of the entire input history up to that moment in time. Um, and then an output function is used, uh, indicated in blue here, to compute uh, the output. So starting from the state, we manipulate the state in order to compute the output. Um, just want to, to indicate that now we call this recurrent neural networks uh, as opposed to feed forward neural networks because we have, let's say this recurrent relation here. So H indeed actually appears both on left and right hand side of the equation. And uh, there is this, uh, I mean, there is, we have introduced this feedback loop around uh, the hidden layer. Okay, so now the hidden layer is actually a recurrent hidden layer. That's why we call it recurrent neural network. And coming to, let's say, more, more closely to the formulation that is used in practice, uh, the state update equation takes this form, uh, which actually is, let's say, an affine transformation of the input um, and the previous state uh, modulated by uh, the in an input weight matrix and the recurrent weight matrix, and then followed by the hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity. Um, and similarly, the output function uh, is applied on top of this uh, state. Uh, actually, the form of the output function depends on the type of problem that you want to solve. But let's say for the sake of simplicity, let's assume it is a linear transformation of the state, okay? So we have the state, the state is multiplied by this output weight matrix, and then we get the output for that specific time, okay? So notice here that I have indicated the uh, weight, uh, the weight matrices, okay? So all of these weight matrices, um, in red, in green, and in blue, all of these weight matrices represents tunable parameters of my system, okay? So I have, in, in a sense, I have a dynamical system followed by an output function. And uh, all of these, let's say, um, tensors here are uh, free parameters of the system. So perhaps I see that there is a message in the chat. Okay, can I ask you, is it possible to, to um, to handle the questions uh, by voice, I'm asking to the organizers. So if the if sure, the sure, students, sure, sure. so please, guys, uh, I invite you to to uh, ask the questions by voice so that I'm not going to 
to to open the, the chat and to to address those uh, individually so if if you can salvatore please formulate your question yeah otherwise uh, salvatore if you want i can read the question for you so i read the question thanks so, a lot how does the history can be represented with neurons i mean not just from a data type perspective but in terms of functions or simply some kind of uh, accessory information. So it can be represented, for instance, as in Boolean logic functions, bit of information, or it can also be defined as a function of neurons input. Yeah, well, actually, um, I think this, this slide is actually giving you uh, an answer. And you, are, you, you can implement that uh, exactly like this type of transformations. So, um, so you can see, actually, the, the, the answer is the second, okay, that, that, that you already gave in the, in the question. Um, there, it's a function of the input, and it's a function also on the previous value of the state, okay? So you have, let's say, a, a set of input neurons, but you also have a set of, let's say, internal neurons that contain this state information. And you progressively update this state information given the new value of the input information that is given in the input neurons. Okay, so now I am describing these quantities like um, mathematical quantities, but they actually are implementable like neurons. So this xt is a vector, uh, let's say, of a number of uh, let's say nx uh, neurons. Mm -hmm. The same is uh, this uh, HT is, uh, let's say, uh, a vector that is composed of a number of variables and every variable is the state of a neuron and the same applies for the output. So I hope, I hope this more or less uh, makes everything more clear. Yeah, I think you addressed the question. Salvatore, please write if you have any other um, doubt. About that. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so in practice, this is our starting point, okay? So the, the other in, important aspect to consider is that when we are dealing with recurrent neural networks, like in, in this case, what we're doing is we, are, uh, um, we need to, to tune these three parameters that are indicated by the input weight metrics, the recurrent weight metrics, and the output weight metrics in order to solve our task. I'm not going into the details of learning in this case, uh, but I'm just, let's say, warning you that there are some difficulties that are, in, uh, let's say, involved by the fact that we want to, to make, let's say, these uh, parameters tunable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I in practice, um, the concept is a lot related to the difficulties of training uh, deep neural networks, because when we consider this recurrent architecture unfolded over time, Okay, so we want to process an arbitrarily long time series using this kind of architecture. What we do, we replicate uh, the same type of architecture across uh, the time step. So we achieve uh, what is represented in this slide on the left part and is called the unfolded architecture over time or also sometimes unrolled architecture over time, which means that in practice, the input information that we inject is different at every time step, but in practice, the transformation that you apply mathematically is the same. Okay, and uh, there are some considerations that can be done here. So in, now we know that in practice, when I compute the output at a certain time step, yt, let's say, um, this can be influenced by the input, uh, potentially even at the beginning of the, of the, um, of the time series, okay? Um, but the way in which the output at our current time step depends on the input far in the past is a lot related to the stability of the dynamical system that is implemented in this recurrent part, the green part in the slide. So in practice, uh, what we're doing, we are injecting input information in this uh, unfolded architecture. Um, but then we are, let's say, we, we make this information pass through a lot of nonlinear transformations. And because of this, okay, there are a lot of technicalities, but because of this, let's say the intuition is that this information can shrink and shrink and shrink progressively over time until in practice it fades. Uh, and, and so in practice, what you have is that you have a fading memory and your system at our 
let's say, current time step um, is no longer affected uh, by the information in the, at the beginning, let's say. And this is not really desirable. Um, and on the contrary, what you can have is that the system is chaotic or unstable, at least. So it means that uh, if I give a, a tiny perturbation in the input here, uh, then this tiny perturbation never fades away and, let's say, explodes over time. Um, so in, in brief, uh, the transmission of information um, when, when we are doing predictions using this kind of architecture can, let's say, uh, undergo a process of, of fading or exploding memory. And this is a problem, okay? So it, it's, it's a problem that can be addressed under the perspective of dynamical systems. Um, and uh, let's say um, at the current, uh, in this slide at least, what we are looking at is the uh, input information propagation, okay? So this is called the, typically the forward pass in neural networks because it's, let's say, the inference pass in the neural network when we are using it. Um, I said that I'm not going into the detail of training, but you may be aware that when you train a neural network, or a deep neural network, or also in this case, a recurrent neural network that can be seen like a deep neural network in this case, uh, then you need to propagate the gradient information along the same path, but backwards, okay? So backwards in this case, backwards in time, from the current time step all the way to the beginning of the, of the time series. So now we, we propagate uh, another type of information, but in practice, we are using the same pathway, okay, for the propagation of the information. And again, without going into the details, but um, at least in, uh, let's say the, the intuition is that again, we are passing an information through a lot of nonlinearities. Um, and in practice, we can have that the gradient propagation follows, let's say, uh, more or less this, as at least the same problems of fading or exploding like the input information in the previous slide. Okay, so perhaps this problem is more uh, uh, famous in literature, the, the, the gradient propagation problem, and so the gradient vanishing or explosion. Um, and in practice, while in this case, I'm saying that using a recurrent neural network, we potentially can latch information across uh, an arbitrary number of time steps. So, I mean, the input, uh, at, even at the beginning of the time series as a pathway in order to be propagated uh, across all time steps until the end of the sequence, then actually this is a problem, it, it can be a problem. Uh, at the same way, uh, also the gradient information, so the error can flows um, following a, a similar difficulty, okay? And so this means that in practice, it is difficult to uh, train and to tune the parameters of the system uh, on long-term dependencies. Okay. Um, so in order to try to solve these kind of problems um, related to the, uh, to the uh, propagation in particular of the gradients across the system, there are a couple of, uh, let's say, um, typical approaches that you can find in literature. One is related to the use of gated architectures, okay? So until now, we have seen the straightforward way of um, organizing uh, a recurrent neural network. This is typically called also uh, vanilla recurrent neural network, okay? Um, a, a possible solution, let's say, to overcome the difficulty of, or at least to, to limit difficulties of the propagation of the information is to make the architecture of the recurrent layer more complex, okay, more complicated. And this is called gated architectures, and it's quite popular in particular for the long short term memory networks and the gated recurrent units. So LSTMs and gated recurrent units, the GRU, which are the, let's say, the state of the art, at least for most applications with sequential forms of data. The basic idea there is that I, I can modify the architecture and the way in which the information is propagated in the, in the uh, recurrent cell state. So the green part in the previous slides uh, to create a pathway, at least a possible pathway for a gradient propagation without interruptions. The second uh, possible approach uh, is the one on which I would like to focus most during my talk. Uh, it's related to smart initialization of the parameters, even of a vanilla recurrent neural network. Okay, uh, it's the it's the sorry. It's the uh, approach of reservoir computing. And the basic idea is that um, I can actually study the uh, transformations 
uh, of the recurrent uh, layer or recurrent cell under the lens of dynamical systems. And then I can provide conditions for stability and study that aspect of the computation. In, in brief, uh, study them in, in a separate fashion with respect to the trainable part of the architectures. And so I can give you a sort of guarantees on the behavior. And then I can use that behavior, let's say that architectural bias of the recurrent neural networks alone in order to achieve, let's say, a, a good performance in many types of applications, uh, even at no training costs. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I'm not going into the detail of gated architecture, but just to, to frame the discussion and to introduce to the topic, uh, this is what in practice uh, a long short-term memory cell looks like. And if you, if you remember, um, when, we, when we have seen uh, the vanilla recurrent neural network, we, had, we said, let's say that we have the input information XT, we have the previous state information HT minus one, then we apply some sort of computation mm, and then we get the output. Mm. Sorry, this, we update the state HT. So given the previous one and the new input, we create this one. And after that, we also compute the output. Okay, so we had a very simple approach in that case. Now, this is much more complicated by the introduction of another entity, another, another long-term state, let's say, um, and a number of gates, okay? So gates are uh, other parts in the architecture that, let's say, allow, um, in a sense, to um, selectively pass information through, uh, let's say, the different parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, without going into the details, and um, if you, I mean, if you want to look at the details, there is a lot of literature on this. But just to mention that instead, when we deal with when when we were dealing with standard or vanilla recurrent neural networks, we only had let's say a single pathway here, this one. Okay, that was much more simple, of course. Okay, now we are making it more complex in order to overcome at least partially the problem of long-term dependencies. Okay, why? Because in practice we create this. Um, let's say the, this uh, possible pathway for like a highway for the gradient propagation um, flowing without interruptions, okay? That's the, the basic intuition behind long-term dependencies with long short-term memory. Okay, but coming to the equations, what I would like to stress um, is that actually um, when we, uh, when we introduce this concept of long short-term memory, even if we didn't go into the detail, we can at least see that we started with vanilla recurrent neural networks that are in practice described by just one line, okay? Just this equation, at least in the, in the state update. Mm -hmm. um, and now this is what we are adding, okay? So we add a lot of extra computation and a lot of extra parameters. So we, we add uh, only, let's say, one, two, and three uh, tunable um, uh, matrices or vectors uh, of parameters. Now we are uh, adding a lot of extra uh, parameters, okay? Like, like we can see here. So what, what does it mean? It, it means that training becomes more slow, okay? Or at the same time, uh, or equivalently, training becomes a lot more computational intensive. Which means, uh, for example, I, I can um, even use a GPU and I know that the training becomes slower and slower. Or let's say I can use um, an high performance computing support like GPUs or TPUs, but now I know that I am using a lot of extra, let's say, effort. Mm -hmm. So also think about if you want to implement this in hardware, uh, in neuromorphic hardware, then you need to implement a lot more. Okay, so you are adding a lot of complexity to your to your system in order to overcome the difficulties of the propagation of the information. Mm -hmm. This is fine, of course, because I mean, you know, th that's the state of the art, uh, uh, at least for traditional deep learning applications for time series. Um, but there are cases in which perhaps you don't want to, let's say, uh, pay the cost of all this extra computation and extra parameters learning. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you want to find alternatives, um, and these alternatives are the core idea uh, of what I'm going to, to show you in the rest of my, all my talk. Um, okay, so uh, like I said, if you have questions, for example, when you see the, the green background, it's a good moment uh, to ask. Uh, 
Okay, and um, well, in, in the next few slides, I would like to, um, to continue motivating, okay, this needs for, uh, let's say, um, making the process of learning a recurrent neural network more simple. So we have seen that, um, we have seen in, in the previous part how it is possible to create uh, a recurrent neural networks, the basic features, and then some few problems and a way to overcome at least partially those problems, introducing more complexity. Okay. Um, so there, I think that this is of course recorded. This is recorded. This talk is recorded so you, you can find it later. Um, so um, yeah, now I would like to, to motivate even further the need for randomization in deep neural networks and to, to frame the discussion a little bit about this. So in, in this, let's say in these few slides, I'm not, um, I'm not focusing necessarily on the concept of deep learning for sequential data processing, but more in general to the concept of deep learning. Okay. Um, and okay, we all know that deep learning had a lot of success in, in, in the previous uh, years and currently uh, it's a lot used in, in the industry, but uh, this comes at a very high cost, okay, in terms of both times, uh, training time and parameters, okay. So the question is, we, have, uh, we can have our, let's say, um, very large, fully trainable deep uh, neural network. Mm -hmm. um, so are we ready to pay, let's say the price for all of these uh, high cost mm, uh, in terms of time and trainable parameters, or let's say computational resources that are needed um, in every case. Mm? So do we need to pay, uh, do we want to pay this cost of training a very complex and let's say uh, huge uh, deep neural network all the time? Um, let's say even, perhaps to pay all this price uh, for let's say one point uh, or one decimal point in the accuracy. Um, well, there are cases where you want to do that, but there are also cases where you don't want to, to do this all the time, okay? And I just want to give you a, a few examples and motivations for, for this. Um, one um, trivial example of this, one straightforward example of this is given by embedded applications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, it, Typically, uh, when, when we deal with embedded applications, we have some, let's say, sort of server or that is in the cloud that distributes the uh, learning modules across a number of devices. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on these small devices, potentially, you, uh, you, um, you don't have a lot of computational resources. And uh, let's say, to, to map this into, let's say, a more uh, recognizable um, environment, typically on the cloud, you can use TensorFlow, let's say, and on device, on the edge, you can use, let's say, uh, TensorFlow Lite, let's say, where you cannot do the learning, but you can on also, let's say, you can only do the inference. So in practice, um, you can run a neural network on device, that's fine. Uh, but perhaps when we deal with, let's say, applications uh, like human state monitoring or autonomous driving or applications like this, perhaps we want also not just inference, but also personalization. Um, not, not only that, but also perhaps we want to use the local information as much as possible without, let's say, communicating a lot of information outside of the device. So we want to improve, we want to, we want to give the individual device uh, in, the, in the ecosystem, let's say, we want to give um, the possibility to do the learning mm, efficiently. So um, uh, this is just to say that there are a number of applications where let's say accuracy is not the only constraint that you have and you have other kinds of constraints. Like in this case, you want to do learning but you want to do learning efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and the aspect of uh, efficiency is also important um, from the, uh, let's say energy consumption aspect and more in general, um, because nowadays we typically use um, deep learning models and we are used to, to consider deep learning models that are, let's say, hugely over parameterized and over complex. Mm. Um, so um, if we do research, let's say in AI, we are more or less familiar with systems that require a lot of energy in order to be trained. Mm. And this uh, has a number of downsides, okay? Apart from the fact that we need, uh, let's say, it, it could be impossible to have embedded applications 
that use those kind of learning. But um, there is also um, another type of considerations that can be done, and this related to the environmental sustainability of the learning and the aspects related to the green AI um, methodology. So basically, the point is that um, if we do research in, the, in AI, let's say our final goal mm, is to assist the people to advance the human technology. But I mean, we cannot do that um, while we destroy the planet because we need to train our deep learning models. Okay, but that's actually what we do, and uh, I mean that, that's quite. Um, that this is a quite relevant aspect because training a single AI model can emit a lot of uh, carbon. Okay, so a lot of CO two, and uh, in the in the slides that you can find uh, for my talk, uh, you can see also um, in some extra slides. Um, for instance, uh, there is a num th there are a number of initiatives and a number of websites where you can actually um, uh, where you can actually um, calculate the the kilograms of CO two that you are using for doing the learning in your in your experiments. Okay, so you can find all other details in the in the extra slides that you, you should find in the PDF version of this talk. But this is just to say that um, let's say having um, uh, in a sense, efficient training algorithms is important. Mm? It's important because we can, let's say, distribute the learning uh, on the edge. We can also avoid uh, all of, let's say, this um, carbon footprint of our uh, training algorithms and also avoid barriers that can be related to the uh, ec economics rather than environmental, okay? Because if training in an AI system uh, that is so large requires a lot of carbons and a lot of energy and a lot of compute, then you need to be rich in order for doing research, right? And this is a, maybe you have a good idea, but then you are not rich and you are kicked out, okay? And that's not really what we would like to, to see in the development of machine learning. So uh, yeah, in the right, you can see a famous, famous, um, unfortunate abstract that appeared uh, really actually in archive. Uh, so uh, perhaps all of us would like to conclude the abstract indicating that we only have $1.2 million uh, for the compute, okay? So just to say uh, that, um, I mean, computational power, uh, increasing the computational power is not the answer all the time. Mm -hmm. And this aspect is also related to neuromorphic implementation and motivates the effort in studying uh, neuromorphic uh, hardware implementations that are alternative to von Neumann. Mm -hmm. This is another story, but I think it's related a lot also to, to the audience. Okay, thanks. Um, all right. So. Um, in order to, to, to understand better what I want to say, in practice, what I'm going to, to uh, what I'm trying to motivate at least is the fact that uh, we know that deep neural networks and deep learning in general, at least uh, from a broad perspective can be, uh, can be seen like a composition of two factors, okay? Uh, the architecture and the uh, stochastic gradient descent or let's say uh, back propagation algorithms. So architectural biases, so the way in which I process the information biases the computation towards specific properties mm, that can be of interest um, and the learning algorithms. So when, when I want to deal, when I, when, I, when I speak of deep randomized neural networks, what I'm doing is I am eliminating as much as possible the learning algorithms and I'm focusing only, or at least as much as I can, on the architectural biases, exploiting them and seeing uh, how far I can go if I uh, um, try to uh, create the architecture hmm, of the deep neural network um, properly in order to process the information with desirable features. Hmm. Like if you remember at the beginning, we talked about stability. Hmm. Okay, and so in, in short, you have a sort of complexity accuracy trade-off where uh, let's say on the horizontal axis, we have complexity on the vertical axis, you have accuracy. And in this, let's say, picture, you have linear models, of course, with low complexity and low accuracy. Um, then you can have traditional machine learning algorithms like super vector machines uh, with featured by more complexity, but also higher accuracy. And at the other edge of the spectrum with respect to linear models, you have uh, deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. 
where the uh, accuracy can be in practice even superhuman or um, I mean very very high uh, at the cost uh, of very um, of increasing a lot the complexity of your system. Uh, so what I want to say is that when we deal with deep, deep randomized neural networks, we uh, aim at being here in this picture. Okay. So basically, what we want to want what we have in, in practice is a system that is from the training perspective just a little more complex than a linear model. Uh, but from the point of view of the accuracy, it's uh, just below the deep neural networks because we, uh, like I said previously, we aim at exploiting as much as possible the architectural biases. Um, and the philosophy comes from a very uh, famous quote by Raimi Hendrecht from a popular, uh, let's say, strand of works uh, on the random kitchen sinks. And you can see here, you have reported the two most famous ones, the, uh, in particular, this one from 2007, then uh, one 10, 10 years later, the uh, Test of Time Awards uh, in NIPS. So you can have a look at the, at the talk by uh, Rahimi at that, uh, Ali Rahimi at that, uh, that conference is really inspiring and really a nice talk. But the point is that randomization, okay, is computationally cheaper than optimization. So. Uh, whenever you have an optimization problem, then you can also uh, try to at least study randomization to provide you, in that case, a, a sort of um, baseline that can be in, uh, that can be implemented very easily with very few lines of code, if you code it, or very simple, let's say, circuit if you want to implement it in hardware. Uh, but the baseline is really powerful because it exploits the architectural bias of the uh, of the, of the uh, let's say, uh, neural network uh, algorithms. And there are a number of studies in literature where in practice, um, researchers are, are trying to, to see what happens if you, instead of training all the layers in your system, like for example, in a deep convolutional neural network, some filters can be randomized uh, under specific properties or some layers entirely can be randomized. And randomization becomes efficiency uh, from several perspectives, um, at least these ones that I'm going to, to mention, training algorithms are cheaper and simpler, of course, because you skip learning at least partially. And then we're going to see something more in detail uh, in a few slides. Um, also from the model transfer perspective, because you don't need to transmit all the weight. So if you have a system in which a number of layers are randomized uh, and you want to transmit that system, uh, for example, you don't need to, 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 to transmit all the weights, all the parameters of your uh, randomized uh, layer because you just, for example, transmit the random seeds that generated the entire layer and you can save a lot of, um, let's say, uh, transfer in that case. Not only that, but it also, uh, it makes the systems even more amenable to neuromorphic implementations. We all know that from the neuromorphic computing perspective, one of the most difficult things to implement in many physical devices and many physical substrates is learning algorithms. So this is one of the uh, largest challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because for example, just to, just, to, to, just to frame the discussion, when you want to implement, uh, let's say the forward pass and the backward pass in a circuit, then you need to implement two, typically two circuits, one for the forward pass, one for the backward pass. Um, if you uh, at least partially remove the need for the backward pass for the learning, then you can save a lot of, let's say, space in your, in your neuromorphic system. And also uh, this, the system becomes more simple to, to be implemented. So uh, efficiency under several perspectives. OK, um, so coming to the description uh, of the uh, mathematical description of what I'm saying, um, I'm just saying that uh, I'm, I'm looking at the computation performed by uh, a layer in a deep neural network architecture, uh, like a composition of two parts. Okay, so suppose we have a feed forward architecture with just one hidden layer, then what we are doing is we are computing an output that is a, uh, a composition, okay, of an output function, G, let's say computed by a readout layer, and uh, a representation function, FR. Okay, that is computed by the hidden representation layer. So what happens is we feed the network the input x, uh, the hidden layer computes this function h of x, uh, so the representation function fr, and then the output uh, uh, on top of this computes also the function g. Mm -hmm. So in practice, in randomized models, we fix 
the, um, the parameters of this hidden representation layer, or let's say of this function fr is fixed, and only the uh, readout layer is trainable. Mm -hmm. So in practice, the, we have two, two operations, a inner operation, that is the representation com uh, function computation that is fixed, and the outer computation that is trainable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in practice, um, Okay, um, so for example, consider a generic function approximation task. Uh, we denote here by x uh, the, the input vector, okay? By f of x, we uh, indicate the model that we want to train, okay? So the function that we want to compute. Um, so we can, we can do this by, um, let's say, considering a number of fixed random features, okay? So a number of random functions, uh, hi, that are applied to our uh, input x. And then we can linearly combine this by a number of uh, trainable coefficients beta i. Okay, here I indicate by beta because I, we focus the learning only on those. Okay, so we have our input, we expand, let's say our input using random features. And then uh, we, uh, let's say we um, create a linear combination of these random features in order to get the output. Hmm? Okay, with, where these random features can, can take the form uh, of generic sigmoid uh, functions, okay, with random weights. These random weights uh, can be chosen according to specific, uh, specific um, uh, random distributions. And let's say um, in literature, there are um, several ways in which more or less this same idea is uh, indicated, okay? So with slight uh, differences, uh, in, in the different cases uh, by different groups, but more or less the idea is the same. And just to mention them, uh, we have random vector uh, functional links that perhaps is the, the, is the most, let's say, um, most known uh, name for this kind of models. Uh, random kitchen sinks, like uh, mentioned previously from the area of kernel machines, uh, extreme learning machines, no propagation, stochastic configuration networks, etc. Okay, a number of ways in which this can be called. Um, but then you see the training um, each is much uh, simple in this case, because for, for doing the training, uh, we just consider, let's say, a couples of x, y. Mm -hmm. Then what we need to do is we collect the feature expansions using the, let's say, the random features that I mentioned, hi, and we can concatenate this into, let's say, uh, a matrix. Um, capital H, and then what we do, we find the solution, let's say, um, of an L2 regularized, regularized least squares problem. So we want to find a solution uh, in the, uh, of a problem that is indicated in this way, okay, where we have used this form of regularization here. So beta is our, um, let's say, is the goal of our learning uh, algorithm. And how to solve this very easily, we can apply uh, the, the linear, let's say, the, the, the solutions from the linear uh, literature. And typically, this is done in, in uh, uh, closed form using Tikhonov regularization, uh, ridge regression with Tikhonov regularization. Okay. So, uh, just to say, learning becomes, and training becomes a lot easier because we can apply all the uh, previous literature on, on linear models. And you can see, um, actually, what we are doing, we are fitting a linear model just that. So that's why the training complexity is not more, is, is not a lot more than uh, the training complexity of a linear model. Mm. Okay, but it, the point is that we are doing this on top of a representation that is given by, uh, let's say, the architecture provided by a deep neural network. Um, okay, so I know that this is just a very, um, let's say, this is a very, um, a highlight perspective on the topic, and perhaps you can be interested in, in, the, in having a look uh, at this uh, recent publication that I had uh, with my colleague Simone Scardapane from the University of Rome. Uh, the, the, this book chapter in particular is called Deep Randomized Neural Network that you can find also on archive at this link. Uh, but actually this was also the topic uh, of a tutorial that I had a few months ago at the last AAAI uh, conference. So you can also have a look um, at the slides and the, in general at the material uh, of this tutorial at AAAI that I have uh, in my website, okay. Okay, so um, this was just to introduce the topic, uh, uh, to introduce the topic uh, of randomization 
as a way to make, uh, let's say, the, the training uh, algorithms more, uh, let's say, more simple and try to uh, avoid or overcome the limitations of uh, recurrent neural networks in, in an alternative way, okay? Not, not, uh, not using, let's say, gated architecture and making the system more and more complex, but perhaps let's try to make it simple using the concept of randomization. And okay. I see that there is a, yeah, there is a question. I can yeah, there is a question. Uh, yeah. Is Luke Corbinat is wondering whether it is possible to train also deep convolutional neural network like ResNet with such an approach, with this approach that you have explained on ra uh, randomization, I imagine. Yeah, uh, well, actually, yes. And uh, this, is, um, th this is a very interesting aspect. Not just that, you can, you can apply this concept of deep randomized neural networks to uh, deep convolutional neural networks, ResNet, of course, but also to transformers. So there are a number of studies in the literature. You can have a look at the, at the tutorial. Uh, so the slides that I, uh, the slide that I have mentioned previously here. Uh, to, to, to have uh, examples of, of uh, papers in which you can see this. So in the last couple of years in, in the major conferences, NeurIPS, AAAI, um, iClear, then we are starting in machine learning, we are starting to, to see applications uh, that study, let's say the trade-off between training, let's say, and uh, so complexity of training and the accuracy that you can achieve. So in practice, the, 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 the final, result is that actually you can do uh, a way of the of training the most part the most let's say connections in your resnet still uh, let's say preserving most of the accuracy that you can have in uh, image or visual uh, tasks okay for further details yeah please uh, refer to the to the uh, information in this web page for the tutorial Okay. Um, so now I'm trying to move to the to the um, let's say to the core contribution of this talk, and uh, what happens when we want to use this concept of randomization as a way to um, enforce efficiency, in a sense, in the design of the system in the case of recurrent neural networks. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully I have convinced you that using a recurrent neural network is a good idea. And hopefully I have convinced you that uh, perhaps uh, randomization is a, is, is a good way to deal with the complexity of uh, training recurrent, uh, let's say deep neural network in, in general. So um, in practice, um, the alternative given by reservoir computing um, in practice uh, focuses on, on, on this uh, major distinctive characterization with respect to recurrent neural networks, okay? So we still are dealing with recurrent neural networks, hmm? um, but we want, what we do is we decouple the treatment of the two components of the system. So we said that we have a state update uh, component, so the recurrent layer in the system, and an output uh, function that is implemented by the output layer of my system. So in the in the very in the simplest architecture. So uh, what what I'm saying that um, instead of blindly training all of this uh, by back propagation, mm, that is the standard way of doing the things, uh, what we do is we try to focus. Uh, let's say individually on these two parts. So the recurrent part is called the reservoir in this case, and the output part is called the readout. So instead of uh, learning the recurrent part, I look at the recurrent part, so the reservoir, uh, actually for what it is. Like I said previously, that's actually a dynamical system. So this evolves a state over time. Um, so I can look and I can study the behavior of this component of my architecture under the lens of dynamical system theory. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, my aim is to, to keep this part of the architecture, sorry guys, this part of the architecture fixed, okay, the inner part of the architecture fixed and the outer part of the architecture trainable, mm -hmm. following the general organization that I mentioned at the beginning for the, for the randomized neural networks. So here we see what is the computation that is performed by uh, the reservoir. Okay, so we said that the reservoir is a dynamical system that evolves a state over time following 
this, let's say, this equation. Okay, so this is the equation that rules our dynamical system. These are the two, let's say, uh, metrics of parameters. Yeah, is, there is a question I can answer. Yeah, I can address it. Okay. Um, again, um, guys, if you have any, question. okay, perhaps by mistake, no. the microphone was turned on. Okay. Um, all right. So I was saying, um, these are the two, uh, the two matrices of parameters, and these are the, let's say, the two matrices that, uh, in a sense, um, can be tuned in order to modify the behavior of my dynamical system. Mm? What I'm saying is that I want to randomize randomize the, uh, these two, these two, these two uh, weight matrices here instead of learning. Uh, but in order to, uh, to do that, what I can do actually is, okay, run, I can randomize them, but I have to initialize them under uh, stability conditions of the dynamical system. So I said, this component of the neural network can be considered like a dynamical system. So if I want to fix these two parameters of my dynamical system, I can do that, but I have to impose some conditions. I have to impose some constraints. Um, these constraints can be seen like um, asymptotic global Lyapunov um, stability condition of the system. And in practice, if you, st if you study this kind of equation from, from that perspective, uh, then you end up with what in literature is called the echo state property which means that in practice, the state um, progressively, uh, let's say, becomes only an echo of the input and the uh, initial conditions are progressively uh, forgotten by the network. But let's say to, 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 to be more concrete, what is done in practice is um, employing some sort of uh, regularization on the, or let's say constraint on this uh, weight matrix uh, WHH, okay? The recurrent weight matrix. Um, in any case, this, um, this is a very active area of research, the one of stability of recurrent neural networks and in particular the echo state property. And so I refer you to the literature for this case. Um, well, um, this is just to introduce the aspect. Instead of doing learning in the entire architecture, what I'm doing is I am fixing the uh, hidden layer, the recurrent hidden layer under uh, stability constraints. Hmm? And I'm limiting the learning only to the output part. This is what uh, I say, this is what I'm, I'm saying, okay? And this is what defines reservoir computing. So uh, in 2007, there has been this very uh, famous paper by David Verstappen and others uh, that introduced the term reservoir computing. But actually uh, this term uh, is, let's say, um, a common, let's say, uh, terminology to indicate a, a number of, um, of uh, approaches that were developed uh, independently, more or less around the year 2001, 2002, by different, uh, by different research groups and from different perspectives. So for example, one of the most popular one is the EcoStack network that has been proposed by Ebert Jager and his collaborators. Um, the paper appears here in Science in 2004, but the, the, the earlier publications were uh, in, in the year 2001. So in this case, we have standard layers of hyperbolic tangent, nonlinearities, uh, neurons, and uh, evolving in discrete time, okay? So more or less, uh, I am using the terminology that is, uh, that, that, that is let's say, derived from the uh, ecosystem networks. Um, but there are al other alternatives, for example, the liquid state machines uh, by the group of uh, Wolfgang Maas uh, and his collaborators from Tugratz. Uh, what they did, they, they discovered more or less the same idea and they proposed more or less the same idea, but from the uh, computational neuroscience perspective, and let's say studying a spike in neural networks, okay? Uh, and uh, another, another popular one is given by uh, Peter Tino and his collaborators from the University of Birmingham. In this case, um, the same idea of having uh, an, a inner recurrent layer that is untrained with, uh, uh, let's say, a trainable output layer was proposed 
uh, in the area of dynamical systems and um, iterated function systems. So from the study of fractal, fractal uh, theory. Okay, that's why th that was called fractal prediction machine. Okay, but the the, the general conception and the, the general uh, insight is the same. Um, we have the network that is composed of two parts: the reservoir that is our hidden recurrent hidden layer. Okay, that implements this equation here. Um, and this has a number of features, okay? As we are dealing with, let's say, uh, random weights. Uh, and so we have, let's say, a number of random, temporal random features in, in our hidden layer. Typically the layer is larger. So the number of neurons is larger than you would have with a trainable architecture. Okay, uh, but in order to, to, let's say, to cope with this possible enhancement of the, of the complexity, then uh, you, you typically employ sparse connectivity uh, among, among the neurons in the recurrent layer. Uh, like I said previously, you randomly initialize under stability conditions given by the echostate property, and I'm going to, to give a, a detail on that uh, in a few slides. Uh, but after that, you leave untrained. Okay, so this is the very big plus that you can have in this, ki in this kind of architectures. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the output uh, can be computed, like uh, as I said previously, by applying uh, this readout layer that computes the output like a linear combination of the reservoir state variables. And uh, following the mathematical formulation introduced in, in the part on deep randomized neural networks, we can see that this part of the architecture can be actually trained in closed form very easily. Okay. Um, and there are a number of advantages that we can have when we do the training in closed form. Uh, one is that, of course, we have only one, one minimum and we don't have uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, local minima. But apart from that, uh, one, one possible plus that I really like a lot is that um, if I distribute my system into a number of clients, then I can, let's say, um, Let's say I can compute locally this kind of information and transfer only a few, a few, uh, a few information across the network, aggregating the the information in in the central server. So just to say that this kind of learning can be really amenable to federated learning. Okay, and it's really safe forward to to do that in applications. Um, yeah, federated learning. I mean, with with some uh, uh, optimality um, guarantees. Okay, so how, how to, to, uh, to initialize our reservoir. So I said, in, instead of doing the learning also in the recurrent part, uh, that is the one that uh, makes, let's say the problems and determines the problems in, in uh, recurrent neural networks. Instead, I just want to initialize them and use them untrained. Mm -hmm. So I want a, a random recurrent hidden layer, but stable. Mm -hmm. Stable means that the state should not be sensitive to tiny input perturbations. So tiny input perturbations uh, should, should fade away during the operation of the system. And in order to do so, uh, we, we go to our, let's say, dynamical system book, and we study that, let's say, that the function that is implemented by the reservoir, like a dynamical system. And in practice, what, what, what we can do, long story short, we can control um, the maximum singular value of our recurrent weight matrix. Uh, this, this gives us, a, let's say, sufficient condition for the stability of the system. Uh, but actually, this in practice is a, a lot uh, restrictive, let's say. So in, in, in practice, what we do in reservoir computing, we control instead the spectral radius, so the, the eigenvalues, not the singular values of this recurrent weight matrix. And we initialize that in order to have a value of this spectral radius that is smaller than one. So in practice, instead of training this recurrent hidden layer, we just initialize it with a fixed desired value of our spectral radius. There are a couple of ways to do that. So to, to become more practical, um, the first thing, the trivial thing that we can do, let's say the naive way of doing that is we generate a random matrix from let's say uniform distribution that we choose. Uh, and then because the spectral radius is a linear operator, then we can just rescale it linearly. It's very simple. We divide by the spectral radius of the random matrix and we multiply by the, the side value of the spectral radius, then we, we, are, we are done. But then if we have a large system, uh, then this let's say becomes uh, very difficult. So we can, let's say, save time. We want to save time for computing, let's say, the weight updates. So we want to use untrainable recurrent data layers, but 
then we need to compute, let's say, the, um, the spectral radius of a very large recurrent uh, metric. So that, that we, we, we can avoid that by using, let's say, the random metrics theory. We use the circular law, for example, and we can end up with a very simple strategy. So we, we can generate a random matrix from a given distribution. And so given the extremes of this distribution, we can already know that in the limit of the number of neurons that go to infinity, that goes to infinity, we have the, the desired value of the spectral radius that we want. So this is, treat like, uh, this is treated like a hyperparameter for our system. Okay, so instead of doing the learning, we just use a hyperparameter. We call it uh, the spectral radius or rho, okay, for, for brief. And that's in a sense um, tells us uh, how much memory we want to employ in our system. Typically, we, fi we fine tune this using um, any, any, any approach for the, for the uh, hyperparameter selection like grid search, or random search or any other alternative. Okay, um, so skipping a few slides, what uh, let's say, uh, what I can say is, is that, okay, this approach seems a little bit naive, but there's quite a lot of theory behind that. Okay, so uh, we can even, let's say, um, explain why it works. Um, and, and also, at least intuitively, I would like to explain this in this slide. Okay, so. Um, the point is, why does it work? Because it, it, it uses as much as, as much as possible the architectural bias uh, of recurrent neural networks, okay? So even before learning recurrent neural networks, if the recurrent layer implements a stable system, uh, it, it has some computational properties that we can use. Hmm? That's the main idea. And what are these uh, fundamental properties of uh, recurrent uh, layers it is indicated in this slide. Um, so the point is that um, our system, uh, if it is stable or contractive, uh, even more, uh, it implements what is called a suffix-based Markovian organization of the state space. Okay, so um, this is depicted, let's say, intuitively in this uh, at least very high-level perspective in this slide. Okay, so uh, suppose that we have these four inputs, input sequences mm, to for our system. Um, and here on the left, we have the input, let's suppose symbols, just A and B, and on the right, we have the state space. So now remember, the learning will take place only in this state space. So for example, suppose that we have, for the sake of simplicity, we have a classification problem. So we want to classify these sequences. So what happens is that, like I said, you can see the details in this paper, but the point is that the, um, the system uh, the reservoir in practice, uh, if it is initialized to be stable, um, then we'll, let's say, we'll map um, uh, sequences that, that share a common suffix close together in a very close points in the state space, okay? So suppose, for example, these first two sequences, they uh, both share the same suffix of length two, they will be mapped into two very close points in the state space. Mm -hmm. um, so here, for example, the state space is just two dimensional, but of course this uh, is just uh, for the sake of representation. Um, and the other two sequences would again also share a common suffix AB that is different from the previous one. So they will be mapped into uh, closed states, uh, but different from the previous two. So for example, these two, uh, the second and the third sequence, they don't share a common suffix. They are mapped into very different points in the state space. Okay, so the point is that now, if I have that my um, that my uh, classification problem is in agreement with this suffix-based organization, so the last part of the uh, time series is the one, let's say, um, that uh, influences most the target. Okay, so for example, these two uh, are uh, positive and these two are negatives. Then, fine, I can find, let's say, very easily. Uh, let's say a hyperplane that separates the positive and the negative examples. So this is to say that when I am dealing with a problem and I have some insights on the fact that this problem is amenable to this suffix-based representation, then I can, let's say, use um, the concept of stable dynamical system to compute the recurrent hidden layer, uh, even avoiding learning in that part of the architecture. 
Um, but then what happens uh, if uh, I, I have a target, let's say, that does not follow, is not in agreement with this kind of, uh, let's say, organization, then, for example, this sample is, is negative, this one is positive, this is uh, negative, this is positive, then it becomes more difficult, okay? So ecosystem networks will, will find difficulties into, in, in solving these kind of problems. And then you need, perhaps, to use other kind of uh, tools. All right, so I hope this gives you an insight and let le at, at least briefly uh, tells you and motivates why these are these type of algorithms can work in practice. Okay, um, coming to the applications, I think it could be nice to, to spend a few words on that. Uh, if you have a look at the literature on ecosystem networks and reservoir computing more in general, you, we, you will find in particular the, the oldest um, applicative papers that will deal with uh, this type of applications, okay? modeling and predicting the chaotic attractor of a dynamical system. This was uh, used like a, the benchmark for uh, a lot of applications of ecosystem networks and reservoir computing in the past years. Um, so in this case, for, for example, I have uh, indicated one of the most popular one that is the, um, the attractor of the Mackey glass equation, uh, where the value of the delay here is 17, which means that the system is chaotic. And so it's possible with ecosystem networks to predict with the, with the, with good uh, approximation the chaotic attractors of dynamical systems. Okay, for me at least, uh, this sounds a little bit abstract. And actually, we uh, had implemented this uh, type of neural networks in practice in, in several European projects. So the, the problem was. Um, let's say motivated by uh, something similar to what I tried to explain in the second part of this talk uh, that is related to distributed intelligence, okay? So in one of these projects, which was called Rubicon, we had the problem of dealing with, an, an, let's say, an ecology of uh, robots and a sensorized environment where the human uh, lives. Mm -hmm. And we had to, 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 to deal with a number of problems like human activity recognition, human localization, robot localization, et cetera, from a sensorized environment. So from sensors. So streams of sensors um, that, let's say, are influenced by the interaction of the human inside this, uh, this uh, environment. Um, so in practice, uh, what, what was the challenge was to, uh, let's say, to implement these recurrent neural network algorithms in very small and tiny devices with like something like uh, four kilobytes of RAM in total. And so in, in order to do that, we cannot do anything else but try to, uh, let's say, implement this kind of ecosystem networks on top of these very tiny devices, super tiny devices, and we actually succeeded in that. So you can find a few uh, examples in the papers that I mentioned here for problems like human activity recognition, uh, robot localization, this was a nice uh, application in a hospital close to Pisa, uh, or also human activity recognition from, let's say, uh, wearable sensors. Okay, in this case, we, uh, we collected a data set that is available on UCI. This is a quite popular data set, I found out. Um, and also we, we uh, participated to a competition, we arrived in second place, so it was quite good because the system was really a lot lightweight. Um, but also in another project uh, that was called Doremi a few years ago, we applied this same idea for clinical applications. So in this case, we wanted to implement on a very small device, like in this case, uh, uh, a Nintendo balance board. We wanted to implement uh, the logic of a neural network that was able to, let's say, uh, predict the outcome of a clinical test. In this case, uh, 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 let's say um, an automatic assessment of the balance skill of the human, okay? Um, so in practice, just to, 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 to mention briefly the type of application, um, in order to, to know if you need a wheelchair or the type of assistance that you need to, to, to have for walking or doing your uh, daily life, uh, the, the clinical uh, staff typically what, what they do, they, they, they ask you to do a number of exercises, they evaluate your performance and they give you a number. Okay, after half an hour of exercises. All of this could be replaced by just 10 seconds, just 10 seconds of, uh, let's say, um, one single exercise on top of this balance board. Okay, so we uh, recorded the pressure, uh, the values, the stream of data from the pressure sensors on the four corners of the balance board, and we fed our ecostat network and we could, let's say, have the output. Okay, and this was used in in, in real um, in real setups. 
Um, nowadays, we are working and we are using this concept of uh, reservoir computing with uh, in this project that is called Teaching. This is a European uh, project that is running. So it's, it's, it's an H2020 project. You can find uh, information on our website or let's say in our um, Twitter or LinkedIn accounts. Uh, but the point is that now we are dealing with cyber physical systems of systems. And the let's say the, the, the central role played by the human inside of this system. So uh, this is much related to the concept of human, humanistic intelligence. Um, and implicit human feedback that gives to uh, a cyber physical system like an autonomous driving application or let's say an avionics application. So in this case, for instance, what the type of learning tasks that we need to, to address is related, are related to, um, let's say, uh, autonomous vehicles applications and the estimation, let's say, of the, uh, the human physiological emotional state, uh, for example, of the driver. Mm -hmm. So in practice, um, the type of tasks that we deal uh, are, are based on that. So we have a stream of sensor data and the, let's say, ground truth information on which we train our system is related to the uh, level of stress or level of amusement, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. So in practice, um, the point is that Ecostat networks, and this is a common, uh, let's say, um, a common uh, pattern, Ecostat networks can give uh, a, a desirable trade-off between uh, accuracy and the complexity. So they can run on very small devices. And for example, this is a very important aspect. Even on TensorFlow Lite, we can manage to do the learning on board the individual uh, clients, um, but they reach a similar level of accuracy on these, uh, on these uh, computational tasks, okay? Right, so in this slide, I, I just wanted to, to, to recall the fact that we have the cloud in which we have our model trained uh, under factory conditions with TensorFlow Lite, then we distribute, and then we can use, sorry, with TensorFlow, full TensorFlow, then on the, on the local clients, we can use TensorFlow Lite to do small updates, uh, and also uh, in a federated fashion, like I said previously. So this is, let's say, a bit tricky, so I'm not going to give it, go into detail, but you can have a look at our website and our dissemination activities of the, of the project to, to, have a, to get a sense of the, in the um, let's say, of the mathematics behind that. Okay, and again, in short, um, EcoStudy Network give and reservoir computing more in general can give a good trade-off between accuracy and complexity. So uh, here I can, let's say, I show uh, um, some results from, uh, from one new uh, uh, reservoir computing architecture. But the point is that the first two rows in every table uh, relate to reservoir computing approaches. The other two are state-of-the-art, tra fully trainable recurrent neural networks. And we can observe something, okay? Uh, the first thing is that you can achieve a similar accuracy between the green, let's say, a part, the green rows, the first two methods and the second two, mm. um, but uh, with a way less trainable parameters and uh, with a lot, uh, let's say, uh, of time that is saved, okay? So uh, you can have faster training, less trainable parameters, but similar accuracy. And this is important from the efficiency perspective that I mentioned at the beginning, okay? So when you, when you train an ecostat networks or in general, a reservoir computing approach, then you, your carbon footprint also, and the energy consumption is way less. Okay, um, in this paper, I just wanted to, to indicate this one because it could be useful to have a sense of reservoir computing in practice is a so, sort of a tutorial on some interesting aspects to consider when you deal with uh, reservoir computing in applications. Um, and then I would like to spend a few, a few uh, minutes in describing let's say uh, some possible hints and let's say um, highlight some topics of research in the area of reservoir computing. So um, until now we say that we said that we have uh, these recurrent neural networks in which uh, the hidden layer, the recurrent hidden layer is uh, randomized instead of being trained, okay? Um, now we say there are a number of concepts, uh, I mean advancements and um, the most interesting one is related to the fact that um, I said we use randomization, right? Um, so uh, the question, the fundamental question now is, is there a way to ensure a sort of quality of the way in which I create this random recurrent layer? 
Um, so the, the aim is that, okay, I know that I want to use fixed dynamics. I want to use, let's say, randomization, uh, but I would like to have, let's say, a possibly a high level or high quality, okay, um, a good reservoir, perhaps a better reservoir than just a random reservoir. Okay, so perhaps I can do some, some, some more work in order to understand if it is possible to find a better reservoir um, for, for my purposes, okay? And actually this boils down to understand um, what, what can be good uh, in terms of uh, reservoir computing. And uh, there are at least, let's say, um, three concepts that I would like to, to mention, okay? The first one is, let's say, we can say that a, a reservoir computing or a, a, a system or a reservoir layer in general, it's um, of higher quality, okay, if the entropy of the recurrent units activation is higher, okay. Um, another aspect is that, for example, I can study the short-term memory capability of this system, which means I can challenge the ability to recall the uh, information, the input information that is injected in the, in the past, um, in order to assess the quality level of my reservoir. So if I can recall perfectly delayed version of my input, then I can say that the reservoir is of high quality. Um, and another, let's say, way in which I can say that the reservoir is of high quality is measuring, let's say, how close it is uh, from a dynamical system perspective to the, um, what is called border of stability. Okay, so the transition between um, stable and unstable dynamics, because we know from, let's say, from dynamical system theory and from recurrent neural network uh, theory that when I have a system that is close to the edge of stability, then that system has, let's say, um, maximized performance. Okay, so all of these three ways of uh, let's say measuring the quality are connected to a number of works that try to, um, in a sense, to um, in, improve, okay, uh, by design of, by learning the quality of my reservoir. Okay, and so for example, this is, I think, a very nice um, approach that is, that is called intrinsic plasticity. Okay, so now if I consider my reservoir computing neural network, I said that I have a reservoir layer that is untrainable and an output layer that is trainable. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps uh, I can relax a little bit this distinction. Okay, I can say I, I can apply learning to uh, at least Par partial learning to the reservoir computing, to sorry, to the reservoir layer, um, but I want to avoid the propagation of the gradient information through the reservoir layer, okay? Because I want to make the learning simple. So this intrinsic plasticity goes exactly in this direction. So to have a local unsupervised uh, learning algorithm. And the, the, the aim in this case is to, let's say, um, adapt the gain and bias of the activation function because this is intrinsic plasticity, it's not synaptic plasticity. So in practice, we tune these two numbers for every neuron, A and B, um, of the, uh, the, these are two parameters of the, of the activation function. But the point is that we want to, let's say, uh, tune the probability density of the uh, reservoir neurons to a maximum uh, entropy distribution. Okay, so in practice, we uh, uh, try to minimize the KL divergence between the actual distribution and the, uh, the Gaussian distribution in this case. Okay, and you end up with a couple of learning uh, rules that are very simple and that can be implemented uh, even on device. The other concept is the proximity to the edge of chaos that I mentioned. Um, so in practice, long story short, close to the edge of stability, the um, performance of the system. So for example, the ability to recall uh, previous uh, inputs is maximized. And the way to compute the proximity to the edge of chaos is to compute the maximum local Lyapunov exponent of the reservoir system from a dynamical system perspective. So this is what is indicated in, the, in this um, image here uh, with lambda. So when, when you have this lambda that is smaller than zero, then you have a stable system. When you have that lambda is above zero, then it is unstable system, that's just to say. So what, what we want to achieve is a, is, a, is a configuration in which this lambda is close to zero. Why it, this is difficult? because this lambda depends also on the input. It's not just a design stage. You can, you can uh, set that lambda is close to zero, okay? This is just the, the difficulty that you can have. Um, 
And then if I want to maximize the performance of my system, um, the literature also tells me that uh, one possible way is to have an orthogonal or at least um, an orthogonal structure in the recurrent uh, weight matrix. So there are a number of studies in the literature that try to change the topology, the way in which the neurons in the hidden layer are uh, connected to, to each other in order to maximize uh, the performance of the system. So it's a very simple way to, to ad address this problem. And actually, uh, it's really a lot effective. And the system is actually um, even more simplified. So in practice here, depicted in this slide, there is one popular uh, architecture that is called the minimum complexity, Ecoster network architecture is one of the most popular in reservoir computing. And in practice, it's very simple because the reservoir layer uh, is an easy to build orthogonal structure. Easy to build because in practice, every neuron is connected only to, let's say, fits only the next one in the cycle and is fed by the previous one in the cycle. So you have a cycle here. Um, and why? You have that because in practice this enforces a sort of let's say um, specific structure in the recurrent weight matrix while you only have uh, let's say the sub diagonal and the top right element that is different from zero uh, but in particular this is a, let's say um, a very specific permutation matrix hmm? and uh, enforces a number of desirable properties so um, there are a number of studies and this is a very popular um, example uh, they try to uh, simplify even more the uh, architecture of a recurrent neural network, still trying to give not only computational efficiency, but also, let's say, a number of desirable properties from a computational perspective. Um, recently, uh, in my group, we have found a way in order to use, to leverage this kind of very simplified architecture in order to adapt the dynamics of the system close to the edge of stability. And we call this the phase transition adaptation algorithm uh, that uses a number, let's say, of mathematical steps uh, to derive a very simple uh, training algorithm, again, for the gain and the bias. So very similar to the intrinsic plasticity in the way in which it is implemented, but with different properties. OK, so apart from a number of results, I would like to focus in the remaining minutes uh, on some others let's say, advanced topics in reservoir computing. And before that, um, one thing that I would like to mention is that reservoir computing is really a lot amenable to neuromorphic implementation. So implementations in hardware, and in particular in uh, unconventional uh, neuromorphic hardware, uh, like, for example, in photonics. And perhaps this can be also interesting for the audience. Uh, so <clears throat> why is that? Because we have, let's say, we said that we have a dynamical a component of the system that is randomized, so it's not uh, trainable. And then on top of that, we have a trainable system. So at least the reservoir, so the, uh, the, the dynamical system that is, that is not trainable, uh, let's say actually, what, what, what is it? Uh, it's a dynamical system that reacts to the input. So it's a non-autonomous, uh, non-linear dynamical system. And if we, uh, potentially at least, we can remove in a sense, this um, software reservoir, and we can substitute it with a, a physical substrates uh, that implements the more or less the same dynamical system that in a more or less controllable way, for example, in photonics. Um, and this gives you your physical or photonic uh, reservoir computing system. Okay, so there is a lot uh, there are a lot of works in literature that tries to that try to to study and to implement uh, in photonic hardware, the concepts of reservoir computing that I try to 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 mention briefly. So you can have a look at this this interesting uh, um, overview paper that gives you a survey a survey of physically implementable reservoir computing algorithms. Okay. So now I'm going to the very last part of my of my talk, um, and I would like to focus basically on two um, two further topics. Mm -hmm. uh, very briefly, one is related to deep uh, neural networks, deep recurrent neural networks, and the other one is re re related to neural networks for graphs. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, regarding depth in recurrent neural networks, this is a little bit debated, but basically we can observe that uh, 
we have seen that we, when we unfold the recurrent architecture over time, we get uh, a deep neural network, okay? But the individual transition, uh, for, for example, from the input to the, to the state, or from the previous state to the new state, or, fro, or from the state to the output, mm, those, are, uh, those are all uh, shallow, so mm, not, not deep. Mm. And there are ways, a number of ways in which in literature you can find that uh, recurrent neural networks can be made uh, deep. So, for example, you can have deep input, or you can have uh, deep readout, or, and this is the topic uh, that I would like to at least briefly mention, you can have deep reservoir computing, okay? So, in the deep reservoir computing, deep ecosystem networks, perhaps this is my most important contribution to the field. Um, in practice, what we have is, again, we have a, um, let's say, a recurrent hidden component that is untrainable. It is, let's say, fixed after initialization, and only the output part is, uh, is uh, trainable. But now, let's say, our dynamical system is no longer just a dynamical system, it's a stacked composition of multiple dynamical systems. And now the challenge is how to, to initialize this kind of system, uh, this kind of nested set of dynamical systems under stability constraints to guarantee, let's say, uh, stability and richness of the of the representations. Okay, um, well, you can find answers in literature, but the point is that you can in practice extend all the all the um, all the mathematical analysis uh, rooted on dynamical system theory also here. Um, and what I would like to briefly mention is that actually, yeah, the deep ecosystem network that is depicted in the previous slide is actually, let's say, a nested set of dynamical system where uh, the input, the external input, let's say XT is the, uh, let's say, driving, um, let's say, um, stimul stimulation for the first layer. And then the state of the first layer becomes the stimulating, the exciting input for the second layer, and so on and so forth until you, until you achieve the last layer. Okay, and the cool aspect is that uh, when we give this kind of structure to the uh, to the architecture, hmm, um, in a sense we are even more simplifying the architecture because we are let's say making it more sparse compared to a fully connected layer. Uh, but so we are giving a structure to the architecture and this structure is automatically reflected into the quality of the temporal representation. So you can have for free some computational uh, power, okay, let's say. Um, and let's say also this affects the mathematical analysis, but let's say perhaps it's more interesting to see um, the fact that uh, when you consider, let's say, a recurrent hidden layer, in particular, in the case of a reservoir com the computing setting, so you have um, a layer of un untrained uh, neurons. Uh, then, if you consider that layer, and instead of having one single layer, you just let's say use the same number of units, but you organize them in a deep architecture, like I mentioned pre uh, previously. Um, then you can get some computational properties uh, for free. Okay, like uh, for example. I have a main, I have a question, Claudio. So if you go oh, yeah, sure. to 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 the architecture here that you're describing, the previous slide, um, the readout layer is it getting um, only a, the output from the from the layer atop the stack, or it is is it getting the um, the contribution from for, from all the layers like one two L? Yeah, you can have both the, the both settings. ways, right? Yeah, both ways. Um, the point is that, um, yeah, it depends on what you want to achieve. Yeah. Um, yeah, now there is really few time to discuss, but the point is that um, in the individual layers, it's also possible to see mathematically that you can have a different properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, uh, the resolution uh, of the representation is different. So you have qualitatively different representations in the different layers. So if you want to deal with the task in which you need to treat multiple time scales, yeah. for example, uh, speech processing or let's say music processing, then you can use this kind of setting where uh, the uh, learning, let's say uh, layer, yeah. the, the learnable layer um, can give a different weight, let's say can properly treat the different uh, resolution. Hmm? Yeah, it's a multi-resolution approach as you're saying, yes. Exa in exactly. In terms of memory, yeah. 
Exactly. So you can have, let's say, multiple levels of representations. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but another kind, another nice aspect is that actually this part, this aspect of stacking multiple layers is also interesting because if you measure, for example, the uh, local Lyapunov of exponents in the different layers, then you can find that in the higher layers you can have um, uh, a system that uh, that is more close to the, let's say, to the. Um, to the border of stability. This is to say that it, it, stacking is also a way not just to differentiate among layers, but also to enrich the representation in a, in a single individual layer. So if, if you want to, if you want, you can use also stacking multiple recurrent hidden layers in this setting. So even without learning to have um, richer dynamics in the last layer. Okay, so you yes. can use this both ways. Okay, so I hope this makes more clear. Yeah, so these slides are just to to uh, to to describe perhaps more in detail, but I think I, I have no time for doing that. The aspects related to the multiple time scales. Okay, so you can find more information in in these papers. But the point is that compared to a, a system in which the same number of units, the same number of neurons are arranged in one single layer, if if you stack them in, into multiple layers, then you have for free, this aspect of multiple time scales representations uh, ordered along the hierarchy of the of the architecture, and also, this is nice. It can give you an idea on, or at least an intuition on, on how many layers to have in a deep recurrent neural network, um, because, for example, you can study, for example, the um, the frequency content. Uh, of the information that is present in every uh, uh, reservoir layer, and then you can see, uh, uh, you can say, I can try to to stack another layer, and then I see if there is a, a shift of the center of mass of this um, of this frequency content, and if this shift is is too, let's say, small, so it's negligible. In practice, what I'm what I'm doing, I am filtering the input information more and more and more over time, and so and over the structure my hierarchical uh, neural network. So when, when there is nothing less uh, remain to, to filter, then I need to stop my creation of the neural network. And then actually what you can find is that when this occurs, it's a good moment where to stop the, the construction of the neural network architecture, because um, also from the perspective of the uh, performance that you can get, uh, I mean, you can exploit very deep uh, reservoir computing neural networks with a very good performance in comparison to, to literature. Um, and there are a number of other uh, important uh, plus, like the fact that you can have an improved uh, memory over the previous input. So just stacking multiple layers mathematically gives you the ability, even before learning of those recurrent connections, gives you uh, an improved performance in terms of memory, okay? Um, so for example, here you can see an, an index, a number that, that is higher for, for um, let's say a better system under that perspective. So uh, the number is a measure of the memory that you have in the system. Um, and here you see the number of layers in which you are organizing the same number of units. Okay, so just stacking into multiple layers gives you the uh, optimized performance. Okay, so in, in our previous works, we have analyzed this under several perspectives, also from the dynamical system perspective, of course, like I said previously, um, you can have richer dynamics when you deal, uh, when you use this kind of organization. Uh, there are a number of applications in which this idea of reservoir computing has been, um, deep reservoir computing has been, um, has been utilized in literature. Um, and for example, in industrial applications here in Santana, they in Pisa, they are they are using this kind this idea exactly to let's say to um, predict the value of some uh, gases that are produced by industrial processes. Um, but uh, perhaps you would like to give a chance also to these kind of algorithms in your research works. And if you and if you would like to do that, uh, you can use my code from my GitHub page. Um, I mean, you can you can see the code is very simple. It's, it fits in one slide, and you can use it like a layer in your TensorFlow uh, or Keras application, and it's very simple to, to do that. Um, OK, so the very last piece of information that I would like to convey, and just 
let's say for you to re remember in the future, um, is that it is possible to use the same idea of uh, randomization and dynamical systems also for uh, forms of data that are more complicated or more complex than time series. Okay, so we've seen the time series data, it's important, it's ubiquitous, etc. But it, it's possible to, to start using the same ideas also when we deal with more general forms of data like graphs. Just to give an example, um, in this case, we have uh, input information that is represented, let's say, in the form of a graph. Like, for example, uh, I can have a molecule or chemical compound uh, that is represented uh, as a graph. You know, you know where the vertexes are the, the atoms and the, the, the bonds are the edges, right? So what, what ideally, at least what, what we want to do, we want to give this type of structure in input to our neural network. And we want that our neural network is able to learn uh, um, a function that tells, for example, in a classification function that tells uh, if this structure uh, represents a molecule that is dangerous for the, for the health or not. Um, and it turns out that in practice, you can use um, in practice the same, the same uh, conceptual tools that I have discussed in this talk um, to create a neural network for processing of graphs. Um, the only different uh, aspects, um, let's say at least the two co different concepts are the following. Instead of the concept of time step, now we have the concept of vertex. So previously we created a representation, um, an embedding mm, uh, state representation for every time step. Now we want to do that for every vertex in the graph. And then we substitute the concept of previous time step with the concept of neighborhood of my vertex, okay? So in practice, uh, instead of computing a state uh, for every time step as a function of the input uh, in the current time step and the state in the previous time step, what I do, I compute an embedding or a state for every vertex in the graph as a function of the input features that are, let's say, attached to that vertex. Like for example, in a chemical application, the type of the vertex, uh, sorry, the type of atom that is represented by that vertex, like a carbon or hydrogen or whatever, okay? Um, and a, a function also of the embeddings, uh, so the state of the neighbors, okay? So the equation is very similar to the one of recurrent neural networks, but now we have generalized to consider the neighbors of the vertex instead of the state of the previous uh, time step, okay? Um, well, uh, and in practice, yeah, you, you, the point is that you, you have this kind of a system. Um, this kind of system, uh, actually, um, if you study that like a mathematical uh, object, um, it can be seen like a dynamical system. And the point is that uh, the solution of my, let's say, ODE is not, uh, um, is not always present because, for example, I can have, um, let's say, a, a cyclic patterns inside my graph. So that, for example, the state of V1 it's a function also of the state V. And so I have mutual dependencies. I can have mutual dependencies between, between vertices in, uh, in the graph. So in practice, this is just to say that we can enforce stability properties in this kind of, let's say, neural operations if we um, try to, um, let's say, um, enforce um, a sort of, if, if we control, in a sense, the, the uh, eigenvalues of these recurrent weight metrics. Uh, in this in this setting, also for the graphs. Okay, so in practice, from this formulation, you can end up with the dynamical system formulation, and you can find, let's say, you can do a similar reasoning to what I, I mentioned for uh, what I described for the uh, uh, basic reservoir computing, um, and I mean. This, uh, let's say, from the mathematical perspective, is described in my uh, last paper at AAAI uh, that is called Fast and Deep Graph Neural Network. So you can have a look at that. But the point is that the system is um, very accurate on the benchmark data set. So, for example, uh, compared to, uh, to state-of-the-art um, neural networks algorithm and deep neural networks algorithms, uh, it achieves a performance that is very similar to that or even better. Mm -hmm. But the, again, the point is that it is much more efficient. Mm 
Okay, so using randomization under stability constraints, also in the case of graphs, can end up with a, a very, let's say, efficient approach and a very good trade off between accuracy, let's say, and complexity of the system. Um, okay, I know that perhaps I am a little bit ahead of time. And so time to conclude. In summary, <clears throat> um, what I try to, 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 to convey in, in my talk is that reservoir computing is a paradigm for designing uh, and training recurrent networks that is based on having um, a fixed hidden recurrent layer controlled uh, under, um, let's say, a condition for asymptotic stability, what is called the ecostate property. We said we can do that by looking at the eigenvalues of the, of the uh, dynamical system that we have. <clears throat> and on top of that, we have a trainable uh, output or readout layer. Okay, so the main property is that it is faster and simpler uh, to be trained compared to standard recurrent neural networks. And this leads to, uh, let's say, efficiency um, under several perspectives with a lot of uh, applications that can be, that can be, that can be uh, considered on that. Um, this is actually a very uh, active area of research, for example, under the perspective of embedded applications, under the perspective of extending that uh, to graph processing, or let's say, also dynamical graph processing. Um, and also, um, let's say, in, in conjunction with studies for unconventional neuromorphic hardware implementations. Um, just to conclude also, let me just um, disseminate a little bit of information about the task forces in which I am involved. So in, there are a couple of task forces. This one is on randomization-based neural networks and learning systems. Um, you can have a look at the website. Uh, in practice, what we do here, we try to, um, to, to disseminate the concepts of randomization in deep learning. Uh, we organized uh, tutorials, uh, special sessions, workshops in major conferences, and also using, uh, also uh, under, the, under the umbrella of reservoir computing, we have this other task force uh, on reservoir computing specifically. Uh, for this, and in particular, perhaps it could be interesting for you um, to know of this uh, workshop uh, that we uh, that I have co-organized with colleagues um, from physical uh, the, um, departments in um, in, in Femto in Besançon and the, in uh, um, in Balearic Island in Spain on uh, deep learning and unconventional neuromorphic hardware. This is a workshop of IGCNN 2021. It's going to happen next week. Um, this, so on July 23, we uh, we have uh, let's say we are going to have um, a Zoom meeting for that, and the link to the Zoom meeting is public, so you don't need to register to the workshop in order to attend that. And so I hope that you can perhaps find interesting this um, this workshop as well. Okay, so uh, I I concluded my my talk, uh, and um, I, I thank you a lot for 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 attending this. Uh, this seminar on uh, reservoir uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, here you can find my um, my email and my uh, LinkedIn and Twitter account. So as usual, I'm really happy to uh, to collaborate. So don't don't hesitate to drop me a line or to get in touch in LinkedIn or Twitter. So thanks a lot for the attention.